Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Talkspace, the online therapy company. Talkspace makes it easy to connect with a licensed therapist handpicked just for you for as little as $32 a week. Using Talkspace, you can text, audio, and video message your therapist and talk about your life, what's keeping you up at night, or even just your annoying coworker. To sign up or to learn more, go to Talkspace.com slash watch. And to show your support for The Watch, use code WATCH to get $30 off your first month. Talkspace, therapy for how we live today. Today's episode is brought to you by the Capital One CreditWise app. Capital One created the CreditWise app so that you can check your credit score anytime you want right in the app. It's free to everyone, so download CreditWise today. Availability depends on presence of credit history from TransUnion. CreditWise is offered by Capital One Bank USA. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me in an office in an undisclosed location in Los Angeles is Andy Greenwald and Sam Esmail. What's up, Sam? Welcome back. What's up? What's up? Thanks, guys. Honorary co-hosts. Welcome to my world now. Yeah. Do not... We we had to hood these these two guys before they came here. That's weird that there's a dude throwing up painkillers in the corner. Right, (laughs) exactly. You're going to have to pick those up, Andy. You know how much I love that scene. (laughs) <laughs> um, Andy, this is a special episode. We're talking about the year in television with one of the makers of television this mm-hmm. year, Sam. Sam obviously is the creator of Mr. Robot. He wrote and directed all of the second season. Um, Which is shockingly, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I was be- being really unbiased, and but it, it actually ended up being my the number one show on my list. Cool. So it was uh, a good pod. Good yeah. job. <laughs> that's that's uncanny. I think it, yeah, I mean, when, it's when, really strange. But like, like when you ran the numbers, <laughs> like, I, I know I you. I looked it over. And I was like, no, I'm just, actually, I there's no way you were one? you yeah, were probably that, very clinical about this. Like yeah, no, uh, obviously system. it was. Um, it, it, it was. I, it surprised me. At, the, at the end of the day, you're like, the, "What's the best directed show I mean, <laughs> created by the most handsome guy?" Right. Yeah. Well, no, well, handsome is one of the criteria. It is. That's right? why Benioff wins. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's um, right. God <laughs> damn it, Benioff. <laughs> we are going through our best shows of the year with Sam today. We're going to talk in this first segment a little bit about some of the shows that we all agreed on. Andy, me, and Sam all made 10 best lists. We'll post those to various social media platforms that Andy is no longer checking. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, you know, but we wanted to start with some of the shows that we sort of agreed on, right? This is going to surprise no one. Yeah, and I think if you've listened to the show at all, if you you know, if you listened to when Sam came on before, you'll know that uh, Andy and I both agreed that the best show of 2016 was Atlanta. Sam, I know that you really highly rate Atlanta. Would you say it was the, your favorite show? It of the was. Year? It was not my number one show. It actually wasn't even. Let me just chuck. Ooh. Double chuck really quick. I don't even think it was my number two. It was not. Was, was Mr. Not Ro- even my number three. Was wow. Mr. Robot number four? Number two show also. Oh, oh, oh! Yeah, actually, now now we're sinking everything down. There's actually, uh, but no, it. I love it. I okay. think it's great. But again, if we go over the criteria, because I did take this incredibly seriously. <laughs> you really did. I, think we'll, I don't know that we ever had a, like a solid conversation about what the criteria is. And this is what's cool about it, right? This is like as television becomes more and more just like fractured, like you know the John Keats urn. Tossed mm. on the ground. Isn't that what modernism is about? Wow. <laughs> so it's like, as you do that, though, did, like your it, definition of what... Did reference just get dropped? I did. Yeah. I, did, I, did. Wow. Okay. Um, I did almost finish college. Uh, as these <laughs> things get, there's more and more television to watch. I think people's definitions of what like prestige, like what the best television is starts to become more and more diverse. And we have a lot of different criteria that we use because when we do our, our completely subjective, the belt, like who's holding it at any given point, one of the things that we rank is just how much something is resonating both yeah, with right. us and at the larger culture. Right. So here's the bigger question about Atlanta for you. Right. As a creator of television and as a director in general, what excited you about this show when you started watching well, it? I mean, that that it's unlike anything you, you, you see. That That's the thing about any, any of these shows that are on my list or movies that I love is that when I'm watching it, I have no idea what's going to happen next and that excites me that and i get excited about it and i want to know what happens next and it was atlanta it wasn't it was from scene to scene and from episode to episode and it did whatever it wanted there's a lot of the things that you guys talked about when you were reviewing the show is like every episode was just almost like you were going to a different planet at the same time though it kept some cohesion and tone and a real voice and the other thing is it was really artfully done i mean that's if we're going to go through the criteria that's one of one of the big things for me is is it done in in an elegant way even as it's kind of being abrasive or subversive or whatever and and Lana just like had a great mix of all those things i think the other thing that's so exciting about it is that as we've entered this it's it's not a post golden age but it's definitely 
a new age on television. A lot of the people who've come to the medium who want to, to break it or remake it, um, one of the ways that they do that is, you know, TV is going to be the new novel or TV is the new cinema. Atlanta f- was not, they were not trying to make a movie, no. right? It's a very different way of thinking about the possibilities of the format. Right. And uh, and honestly, you know, it's it's good that you bring that up because here, here's the deal. When you feel like a TV took that memo, we're good. This is a novel and every yeah. episode is a chat. You can feel that. You can feel that they're kind of forcing that down your throat. And that's what I, that, that's the thing where I'm like, well, this is predictable now. I know exactly what you're doing. I know, I know exactly how you're shooting this because you are trying to get that, you know, award or whatever for the cinematography. And I know the performance, it, like it, everything just starts to fall in line. And then that's when the excitement goes away for me. For me, it's Atlanta just it almost looked it almost felt like they just didn't care about anything but to tell to tell the story that's like deep in their hearts and that doesn't actually follow not not that it doesn't follow any formula but it actually actively tries to subvert formula i was like uh, actually going out of its way to be you know experimental and unique i was going back for some reason i found myself uh re- there, there's this new app called Filmstruck that you can, you know, it's like kind of... Is this the Criterion? Yeah, and it's like the, the, the very like like cinema scholar version of Netflix, basically, where it has like a lot of like great foreign films. It's like all, the whole Criterion collection is on there. Anyways, long story short, for reasons relating to The Ringer, I was wa- re-watching a bunch of Jarmusch, Jim Jarmusch movies, and I was re-watching Down by Law, and I was like... That's a great movie. This is Atlanta. Like, this is... Yeah. The way it feels and the way that, like, I, the, the, that, that show makes me feel like the way it, I did when I saw mystery train and down by law and do the right thing and slacker and some of those indie movies that i like grew up on where i was just like i feel like i am it's not through world building that i'm getting to know this world it's just through like a sense of place and it's just through like a sense of familiarity with the characters and you know we talk about this all the time about the blurring lines between but i do think that hero marai brought a really the director incredible sensibility to that and i know what you're saying when you're like oh you guys are that's like this is the shot you're going for that kind of looks like the the cinematographer tumblr picture right, or whatever exactly but the the way that the, the the cinematography blended with the like like the laconic way that that show unfolded really 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 like resonated i think me. the cinematic reference is really good because one of the the cul-de-sacs we found ourselves in and talking about television is sort of the post lost hangover which is well, where are they going? Yeah. Where are we going? Like they have to know, and people start to get nervous. They don't right. trust the creator. I mean, you, we can we can yeah. we can segue pretty easily with this. <laughs> it, does he know where he's going? Is, is he? Do we trust where he's leading us? And the feeling I got from those Jim Jarmusch movies and other indie films that yeah, I remember like Hal watching, Hartley movies, Hal Hartley stuff. movies yeah. for sure. And Atlanta is this feeling of sort of exquisite disorientation. It's a feeling of I don't know where they're going, but they seem to know, and it's a pretty cool hang. So let's go along for the ride. Like. Being unsettled by something that you watch is actually something to chase. It's just very, very, uh, it's a very delicate balance. And it's, and it's, you know, at the end of the day, another one of my criteria is it's just creative. And obviously that word gets you, gets thrown around a lot. But I mean, I, I really mean, I mean, there's a, how many shows can you think of that actually try and create something new? Even if it's inspired by other movies or books or whatever, music like that they're actually trying to be creative in every choice that they make, that nothing's taken for granted, not the production design, not the costume design, not the performances, not the way that people, uh, that w- the way the plot will unfold, that there is something that every, at every moment they're trying to say, well, wait a minute, what if we do take that left turn? And that's what Atlanta is, is just a bunch of beautiful, awesome, amazing, exciting left turns. And it had that, it has that feeling for me. One of the things that I'm going to like treasure and, and you know, we, we were talking right before we started about this idea of like, are any of these shows rewatchable? And in an age when we're inundated with so many choices to what to see, like, would you go back? And I would go back and watch Atlanta. In fact, I'd love to go back and watch it in like this big block, like in two, Mm -hmm. you know, in in like a three and two hour block, because it it really does remind me of the, when I was watching this show of the feeling I had pre social media of like discovering something like Pulp Fiction or discovering something where you're like, Oh, I can, I'm learning about these influences in this really like interesting way rather than directly having right. it being communicated mm-hmm. and downloaded into my brain. And just the fact that, you know, the Twin Peaks meets hip hop tagline was very seductive, obviously, for us and people who like rap music and Twin Peaks. But just the fact that there were things like David Lynch and trap hip hop like being thrown around in the same thing was just super exciting. Yeah. And can I just throw one more thing about Lana? Because the one like, <clears throat> The thing I hate least probably about 
making a TV show or even what, and, and then obviously watching TV, the plot. Because I will say this, like you mean the thing you like the least, care about the least, the plot. You yes, don't, yeah. that I like the least. Yeah, plot. It's and because ultimately we've seen plots are like just yeah. the machinations that you want. That, that's the Trojan horse to learn about a character, a voice, a world. And Atlanta, I mean, they have a semblance of he's trying to, I guess, get a music career for Paperboy and. But I could care less about that. Right. That wasn't what the point of it was. They weren't always trying to reorient ourselves to, to we got to follow this story. And we got it like it wasn't it, it wasn't hamstrung by that. It just became what it was. And it was like a hang piece. And that's sort, some of my favorite movies, you, you know, and all, just bringing up all the references. I can't I don't remember the necessarily the, st- the story of Down by Law, but I remember those characters. Yeah. And I remember that world. Do you get frustrated then as a creator when viewers get hung up so much on plot because fuck plot i'm be- telling your viewers right now fuck plot i'm telling you plot doesn't matter <laughs> you get hung up on and that's you know one of the reasons look the frustrations are lost I, on the one hand i see because you you also you want you look the thing is you want to trust the creator writer director whatever that they're they're you you're in good hands that they're going to take you to a place and that there there's intentionality behind everything they're showing you and and they're not just fucking with you. So on the one hand like you need plot there to like kind of be the foundation. But that's like looking at a house and like liking the bones and the but you know that's not the point. The point is like you know what what are you going to do with that? That's just the one layer and it's to get hung up on that to me is a real mistake because that's when you have run of the mill shit. That's when you have that I hate to say it those tv shows that it's just like you know what you're gonna get that's when the predictability comes in and because it's all just a you know it's like i i know one of the shows that you guys always talked about this year and then frustrations with you andy about westworld in terms of like is is it just about the plot machinations right. is it just about solving uh the puzzle um and is it not about anything else i mean that that and westworld kind of like it kind of shown a lot, you know, it exposed that to a certain extent that, you sh- you know, for me, it's like always a danger to really fixate on that. Well, that- another show like that, that I kind of, that, that definitely, I think had a very compelling plot, one that I think kept people's attention throughout its, 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 its run was Night Of. Yeah, I was going to say, because that actually had a sort of a conventional log line. But I, but, but the same way that Sam's talking about Atlanta, like I cared about the mystery at the heart of the night of and it was an interesting way of telling that story where you have an unreliable protagonist narrator Nas can't remember necessarily what happened that night and Sam are, hates stuff like that by the way <laughs> <protagonists> <laughs> that don't remember there are that. points where he's starting to doubt his own innocence but it was probably the seventh most interesting thing about that exactly show to me. What, what number that's on your list at, at what at that's number two? number two and it was a it was pretty tight I, I think i even said the other wow, day number two yeah and i think i said the other day that it was my favorite thing and yeah. then i just thought long and hard about about atlanta and i was like I night of is my number six yeah um and it's my number nine tell, okay you, 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 you talk us first? into it yeah so i love the night of i i the 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 pilot i guess is mm-hmm. that what, the first episode one of the best first episodes you know, I've and shot I've in seen. 2012, which is I know, great. yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, every performance down to like the you know, the the, the cameos to to Riz Ahmed, everything to so the night just, sergeant. What's it, who's the who's the dude who's behind Shankman. the desk? Yeah, and the, the, the pharmacist, yeah, and oh, the, the Fisher Stevens. Yeah. I mean, it's just uh, uh, brilliant performances. The cinematography was amazing. It was definitely, it definitely, you, you could tell that it was in the hands of a really true filmmaker. Um, I, I can't, and it was one of those shows. So like one of, another criteria, I had to watch it every week, definitely. And I, this was in the middle of like editing yeah. Mr. Robot and like, no, but that was the one show I was not going to miss on Sunday nights. Um, but it did, it did meander a little bit in the middle for me. And, and I usually love meandering. I fucking like, again, <laughs> Atlanta is one big meander to yeah. me. But so it meandered in a way that I, as much as, I, it, and it was weird because I loved Again, all the performances, and I loved I loved the way it looked, but I wasn't having as good a time as I wanted to be. And then it picked up for me back at the end, save for you know the the the, the, kiss, the kiss, which I wasn't I wasn't a huge fan of. I don't know if it like you know one thing that I will say I do argue like some people say, well that ruined the whole show for me. I mean that that seems to be a little ridiculous to pick one moment out of 
of an otherwise like really great show and say, well, then everything is like, you know, everything gets announced. But um, but yeah, it was really that middle part that I just I, I, I found myself losing a little bit of interest. Do you want to say why it, it's a sort of middle of the pack for you and then I'll make my defense? Sure. I mean, I, I think that I, I mostly agree with Sam. I just thought it was absolutely captivating. It was beautiful. And I love the atmosphere. I mean, I'm, I, I don't want to say a show about people getting shivved in Rikers is a world I want to spend extra time <laughs> in. But it was a world that was so lovingly created and so specifically created with yeah. every choice that was made. Atmosphere that, is a good way of saying it. The tone of it is unlike it's a very so specific and unique. So specific and unique and so New York. And the fact yeah. that the show had the the, the creators had the the curiosity to think about who um, Nas's dad's co-owners of the cab medallion yep. were so that they were characters in the show as well and the hardship placed on them yeah, as the not even tertiary characters yeah. it right. was a larger world um i think the thing that i kept coming back to and thinking about it and by the way i, I think i really appreciated the endings i thought it was really masterful how they made it ending in which what actually happened didn't matter which is the hardest thing to do with I, one I of these who done it yeah but it, it because by the way into, it doesn't it doesn't matter yeah. it, nobody actually cares yeah. it's about why or how or right. what happened next but in uh, a show like this, and Chris is what we talked about when we were reviewing it, it's it, 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 not unlike a lot of the British crime shows that we love. Um, at a certain point, they turn into not Law and Order, but they, at a certain point, the, the atmosphere setting has been established. The yeah. questions have been asked, and then you have to take the turn into answers. And answers are never as interesting as questions. So that started to happen for me in the middle when plot right. took 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 the back the driver's seat. Right. Yeah. I mean, so. For me, the, I actually probably have spent more time thinking about Night Of than I have any other television show this year, with the exception of Game of Thrones, I guess, out of professional obligation. I, more know, than, I know what you're talking about. But just in terms of, um, so I, 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 I've i rewatched some of those episodes. And one thing I think is actually really not talked about enough when it comes to this show is the the people it comes from, Richard Price and Steve Zalian. So if you read Clockers, Richard Price's novel, there's... And in a lot of his books, but Clockers specifically, there's this whole weird middle part of Clockers. I mean, like a huge part of Clockers is the main detective um, providing like ride along for a movie star who's thinking about playing a detective. Oh, yeah. And he's like, the detective's like, maybe I'll become like a consultant in Hollywood and get out of this racket. But there's a real like meta quality to like the actor asking the detective, like, would you do this? And what is it really like to do this? And this, all this conversation and Price wrote on The Wire, which was always sort of referencing the way we process crime stories and police work in popular culture. And if you go back and look at The Night Of, for as much as it is just like a straight story, an incredible character study and, and, and everything like that, there's a lot of really interesting commentary on like the state of the crime procedural in popular culture now. And even that moment, you know, the the kiss, which I think can be read both as kind of a critique of what happens to characters like that in those shows, but also if you go back and look at some of the character beats um, of that character beforehand, of Chandra beforehand, she's like reaching out for someone. She's like a very lonely character who's mm -hmm. reaching out a lot. And that it kind of really makes sense that earlier in the episode, she sort of almost lunges for Nas's mom for a hug. Oh, and yeah. the mom's just like, get away from me. This is like the, the worst time of my life. Like, yeah. I don't want to. You don't, also, you don't really know me. Because that's where she says, is my, is my son a monster? Yeah. And she's like, no, 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 let's hug it out. And she's like, get off of me. And then that later in the episode, she kisses Nas. So this is obviously like she's, she's looking for something in there. I don't know. It made me think about the genre in a way that I found very, very, very stimulating. And also then it's just like sometimes competency is like underrated. Yeah, I mean, and like every craft, single part of that show from the writing yeah. to the, the cinematography of Frederick Elms shot some. And I think um, who's the guy who shot... There will be blood. Is it Ellswit? It's Ellswit yeah. shot the pilot. Yeah, and I think the he also. Episode. I heard shot some of the inserts. Even the inserts wow. were just beautifully yeah, just lit. Just like and, the rain on windows. Yeah. I mean, like it. it I suggest I, it'll stick with me for a long time. And in terms of going back to it, I think that's the show that I'll go back to the most this year. One question um, specifically. See, I would rewatch it just, uh, but I would probably skip skip the yeah, middle, a few episodes. Of the yeah, I, I do love the ending and the opening. When we. Uh, Chris and I were talking about uh, Riz Ahmed's performance um, for a podcast that's going to run after this one for our end of the year podcast. And we were just talking about the what an impressive out of nowhere performance that was and how much of the show really hinged on it, specifically on a character changing so dramatically yeah. and being, as Chris said, unreliable and also just you know physically morphed throughout it. I was curious, Sam, since you have, I wouldn't compare them one to one, but you right. have a lead performer right. who, um, you know, a lot of the sh your show rests on his ability to do some 
pretty out there things and sell us on them. Um, do you have any insight in what it's like directing a performance like that or coaxing it out or casting it right? Or, or It's casting it right. I mean, look, I can't pretend to sit here and, and take credit for anything Rami does. And I think, I think honestly, it's getting out of their way. I mean, you have, you're asking for them to do so much. Who knows how much Riz got told? Like he probably asked the question, yeah. did I do this? You know, I don't know if he read all the scripts beforehand or not. And I always try and like give Rami all the, all, as much, as many answers. Sometimes he tells me, don't give me all of it because that's his process. And he wants to, because the, at the end of the day, you can't play two things. Mm -hmm. You've got to play one thing. So in the night of, presumably Riz was playing innocent. And even as he was doing some shady shit, he couldn't play guilty. He yeah. had to stay true to the innocent and that's where the complexity comes in. That's where the layers come in. And, you know, obviously he just did a brilliant job at, at doing that um, and, uh, and keeping us on our toes. I don't, if you're going to ask me how the fuck they do that, I have no clue. <laughs> I just stand back and get mesmerized by it. So let's talk a little bit about Game of Thrones, which is obviously the kind of elephant in the room when it comes to shows this year. And in our room. And in our room. Yeah. Um, okay, I got to level with you guys. Uh, Game of Thrones is not on my top 10 list, and here's why. You've just as, been expelled from... As a former, <laughs> recently former television critic, these lists are demanding and exhausting, and I was still thinking about it with that frame of mind. And what I just decided, for my own sanity, because I wanted to put so many shows on this list, and I wanted to showcase shows that I hadn't showcased before on this list, I've decided, completely arbitrarily, because let's face it, lists are arbitrary, that HBO's Sunday night programming block of Game of Thrones, Veep, and Silicon Valley, which is probably the best programming block any network has at any time at the, at the current moment in our television history, is just ineligible. It's John Larroquette at the Emmys. If, if, if he was eligible for it's Night Julia Court, Louis -Dreyfus at he the would Emmys. win. Well, she should yeah. Larroquette it. He, it would win every year. And I wanted those three slots. There's no, there's no legitimate argument that you could make that those three shows. This is weak. It's weak. There's it's, no legitimate argument. Weak. But it's I wanted to put other things on the list. So but that's like, the only reason why. Let's just say in a, in a world in which you, that, yeah, that was not. Like, I'm like, curious how that high soil. it yeah. would go. Um, I would put Game of Thrones at four, five or six on my list. Okay. So Sam and I both have it at third. I would say third. five. Yeah. And I would say that I, this is probably... Among my favorite seasons, this one that definitely, just happened. Definitely, definitely. I thought it was Agreed. probably the most moving in a lot of ways. It, it, in terms of production value and and certain cinematic qualities, I think it was I mean, about as music, good as any movie. I mean, everything yeah. was on point. And, and, and not, you know, the one thing I will say, because this is the thing about Game of Thrones that's amazing to me. The after the, show? Every, <laughs> That, that's the second. That's number two. It. If Sorry, we're going to do the top it. 10 list of all the amazing things of Game of Thrones, your podcast is, is, <laughs> is up. Is it, in, is it in the top two? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the one thing, the one thing is, I mean, and this is, by the way, the problem with judging seasons, uh, you know, at standalone. Because it's not, especially with a show like Game of Thrones, it's not, it's one story that they're telling over these several different chapters or however you want to describe them. So, for example, I think... Season was it was this season six? This yeah. is six. So five got a lot of shit. Yeah. Right? Too slow. What the hell's going on? Blah blah blah. But and I remember really liking it. And then it all pays off in this season. Yeah. You couldn't yeah. have gotten away with uh uh when Cersei takes back and like uh takes down the sparrows and um and the battle of the bastards, that emotional impact wouldn't have worked without season five. Yeah. You needed that you season need to lay the of build up to yeah. get to this season. So, I mean, in a weird way, it's like Game of Thrones just kind of proves that season fives of shows, the, the seasons where maybe it's not as, as exciting or thrilling, it's a little slower, it's a little like, you know, let's downshift, let's like actually make shit terrible for all our main characters so that when, when they come back, it's, uh, it's, all, uh, it's that much more worth it. That that that's what I think is kind of remarkable. In a lot of ways, season six made me appreciate season five yeah, a lot more. Absolutely. I mean, I, as I haven't mentioned this on the podcast in a while, nor you, but I, as as a non book reader, I was kind of surprised by how overwhelmed I was by some of the emotional moments in the season because you realize you've spent five or six years right. of your life with these characters, and you have watched Jon Snow go from this sort of peon in the family to the once in future king character that he becomes and and this almost supernatural character and to see some of the things that they did 
with the touch that they did, because one of the things that I think people were sort of dinging them for in season five too, was maybe not having the best sensibility when it came to certain moments, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of, of treating certain things like in a, in a way like, like this, like Sansa. I know what things you're talking about. Yeah. This season, I just was like, wow, like this, the tower of joy and John reuniting with Sansa and like the, and, and, and Tommen and all these like set pieces that they did. It's like, I don't really know like how you can be better than Battle of the Bastards. I, I, I mean, it's <laughs> and the other thing is the weird thing about Game of Thrones is they don't have to do they don't have to experiment no. with filmmaking. They don't have to come up with that crazy musical score in the season finale when uh, when they blow oh, yeah. up that building. Yeah, you don't have they, they they've got they they've got me already, and then they do that on top of it. Then they have crazy filmmaking. I can't ever pronounce his name, Miguel. Uh, Spachnik? Yeah, yes. Um, who I think did Battle of the Bastards yes, and, yeah. and the finale. You can't... You, I, and, and that one great long take in the middle of Battle of the Bastards. Yeah. I mean, that shit's better than anything I watch in the movie theater. This is the thing. I My top 10 movies, they're, no, they're, I don't, they're, they're, there's some really good movies on there. But there's nothing in those movies where I was like, in terms of like any of the action set pieces or any, mm -hmm. of, the, any of the sort of monumental harmony of all that, like... There's some stuff in Arrival that rivals it. There's there's some stuff here and there, but like they were they were the best movie of the year. Yes. Let, let, let me say as an attempt to 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 make peace with my terrible weak decision making. Yeah, this, <laughs> this was really we're trying to shame you. I, I feel very ashamed. I, Please, you okay, you've been ringing good. the bell at me nonstop, <laughs> and it's fair enough. I agree. This was a, this was an oversight on my part. But uh, in addition to everything you're saying, all the praise you're laying on the show, I would say that this was the most human season. And I really appreciated that. And I, you know, an assumption that, that Chris and I have made as non-book readers and that, you know, Jason Concepcion and Mallory Rubin have sort of supported us in saying this, is that there was a feeling of the yoke being lifted, that they were finally off the rails and they were making their own show towards their own ending. Yeah, it's a little funnier, too. And because of that, there was a little more looseness. Like, we, we got some happy endings. We, not endings. We got some happy moments. We got <laughs> hero moments. We got a lot of humor. You know, I, I, I always think that for as much attention as something like Battle of the Bastards get, you don't earn that unless you have Dinklage getting drunk and making jokes. Right. You need both. One has to balance the other. If it's all one thing, then then the show is one note and ultimately not right. satisfying. And so to let those actors and let those characters breathe was a relief and not just because of the fact that we we were unable to breathe during yeah. the broadcast of this season. Do you, do you feel like um, when Game of Thrones ends... I was telling um, Zach when we were driving out here today about how when we first started doing this podcast, there were four or five um, central television texts that it's it felt like everybody was sort of in agreement. The consensus. This shows. is what we're talking about. We're talking about Mad Men. We're talking about Bringing Bad. We're talking about Game of Thrones. Like we had this um, monoculture almost within prestige television, and obviously, like some other shows only had like a million and a half, two, three million viewers, but like the Velvet Underground, every one of them became a television critic or a television writer, it seems like, or a podcaster or whatever. Or, or all three. Or all three. But when Game of Thrones ends, do you see, do you see from your perspective, Sam, like a show that, is it going to be a time when there's going to be a show that replaces it? Or is there going to be just like everybody is sort of spread out across this huge landscape? That, that's a good question because the one thing that's great about Game of Thrones is like it's a... It feels like it has that. It has the heft of like a blockbuster movie. Yeah. It's an expensive movie. It's a fantasy, and it's R-rated. That's just something we didn't have growing up. Like, uh, or did we? We only had, we kind of, maybe more like more, action stuff. Though. More more action, yeah. not like you know, not like an R-rated Lord of the Rings. That's also just really well written and great characters. And um, and so I don't. There's only a couple places that's going to make that. Is that show on the air right now? Right. I don't. I don't know. It doesn't doesn't feel that way. I I wouldn't. I I don't. Do you guys have? Do you think that's? I a guess good Westworld is probably the closest thing. Right. But I think a lot of that is the desire to have that, and even if it's whether it's lacking or not, you know, that that's up to people who can engage in it. But I think people want that experience, and that's helped power the show because they want to be solving puzzles together. They want to be having the offline experience. You're talking about Westworld. Westworld. Right. I, I I think that. Um, but that doesn't feel like a. Is that like? Does that feel like what I'm talking about? Like this grandiose no, blockbuster. A, I think it. I think saga. people want it to take is the it place a saga? of saga. I don't know if the, Westworld's a saga. The only things that I would argue felt slightly similar, obviously on a much smaller scale this year, 
Um, and it gives a chance to talk about them just in brief because they're both on my list. I don't think they're both on either of your lists, but I think Stranger Things that's on my list, yeah. captured people's imagination and got people excited. You yeah. know, it's on my list, not because it was the most masterful or the most well-made or or because I love the monster, but it was fun. You know, it was very entertaining. And I and I love it when people are all entertained together. I think that the ding against it um, in terms of becoming a consensus show is Netflix because people didn't watch it at the same time. So it sort of was robbed of that moment. If that people if that was we're talking about it, it all summer. Absolutely. I mean, but it, it wasn't weak to it week. It felt like E. T. had come out over the summer. It yeah. felt like it reminded me a little bit of that. Like Absolutely. But what if everyone had watched it like that but so that's a movie comparison, which is important right, to me. Right, right. It wasn't the week to week. So by the time we got to episode eight, you know, when we were all excited to go into the upside down together. Right, right. Um right. the other one that I think took its took its place in terms of conversation was um American Crime Story, People versus OJ Simpson, which is in some ways, also a grandiose fantasy saga about people with uh, big egos and big accents clashing on the biggest stage possible. But really, to me, I was just so impressed. I, I was impressed with the performances. I was impressed with the spectacle. I was impressed I liked a Ryan Murphy show, which I've never done before. But mostly... <laughs> Have you ever seen Popular? No, I never saw Popular. That's actually good. That's a good one? I would, re- I would visit that. That's the high school one? That's, a high, that's his first one, I think, too. Yeah. And it was pretty short-lived, right? Their like, first album. Yeah, yeah, People's yeah. first albums are always, always the, the best. One season. <laughs> um, but I thought that that was such a smart move by FX because it's basically like everyone knows this is known IP to, to say something super annoying, yeah. but it, it, it riveted people in the same way it riveted people the first time it was, it was like a, it was TV as circus. And instead of pulling something from our collective imagination, like a dragon, it was pulling something from our collective, you know, oversaturated media well, memory. I mean, it was 20 years old. So I was impressed with the way a lot of people, it felt like people were watching that week to week. But I mean, did you see the? You saw the documentary, right? This is. Do you want to? Do you want to do a detour? Do you want to? Do you want to do, do this? This is your number one show of twenty sixteen. It, it, it right? wasn't my number one because I was told initially <laughs> that I wasn't <laughs> allowed to bring in unscripted. But and, and by the way, I think that's a good rule. And I know I, I know cheated you, too. You yeah. cheated. Um, the thing is, it is. It is kind. Of, uh, this is already weirdly. It's weird to compare shows like Atlanta and Game of Thrones. I mean, you know, it's just they sure. couldn't be. They, I mean, they're like plan, planets apart, but. To then throw in unscripted, it's that's even weirder because now you're like, okay, there's no per, per, judgment on performance or necessarily cinematography to a certain extent, and obviously scripts or anything like that. So, having said all of that, the thing that I obsessively binged because I I, I watched it way after it aired, I guess, um, and just could just was so super consumed. And like thought about it the entire day, and 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 then and then watched more at night. Not to put you on the spot here, we were told by a source who has knowledge of the situation that you may have been watching this on an iPad late, late at God night when damn you should it, have been Emmy. sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, that's what I was doing. I couldn't stop, and it it was it was that weird, uncanny thing of you know. Well, obviously, I lived. I was you know sixteen when the whole LJ thing went down, so I had bits and pieces of what uh, uh, of what I remember from the news. But this was just a classic. It was like, it was literally like well, Citizen Kane. It was the rise and fall of of this great this is, American this is Ezra Edelman's uh, OJ documentary, Made in America, right? Yeah. That, that oh, is a, yes, yes. Yeah, the only, thing, I, made it. I, the only thing comparable thing, I, the only thing I can think of is the Ken Burton Civil War. I mean, I in mean, terms of scope. Yeah. yeah, in terms of saying something about America. Yeah, you know. in terms of being able to see something both in the granular level of like the legal proceedings and the, the you know like the, the, everything from the 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 just the news. You feel like your fingers are stained with the Los Angeles Times newsprint to understanding twentieth century race relations. It, it was just astonishing. And this the, and this is the thing about it that, and especially because it is a documentary, it just goes back to like. It's just a great story, and the way they told that story was—it wasn't just the 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 things that we obsessively watch about on the news. It wasn't just about the trial. It's it was a, it was his life, mm-hmm. and they told it. They they just told it like this story, like a, just the story of a man, and the storytelling in it is just a, a, a before and after the the trial. That it that was just the sensational part. It, it was it was just a complete picture. And that, the one thing like you know, and not to bash the night of because I actually really love it. it obviously is in my top ten. But that's maybe like that's a really difficult thing to do in scripted, especially because that middle part, that's that's the thing that strained for me is that I was losing that uh, urge to want to keep watching. Whereas with OJ with 90 minute episodes, you know, I love how 
critics like to complain about <laughs> running times. <laughs> Extra. But here, here Ex we critics. go. Ninety minute episodes, and I could not feature length episodes, and I could not stop watching. And it shows you that it's not about running time, and it's not about um, uh, it, it's not about all, uh, all the window dressing. It's about storytelling. It's about are you compelled to watch the next thing. Um, and, and they just did that in Aces. I mean, they executed that pretty flawlessly, in my opinion. If there's a, a phrase that we've used more than any other this year, aside from uh, Valerian. Problematic. Uh, it's been pre-existing IP. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, um, recent history is the pre-existing IP of prestige dramas now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I, I was thinking, yeah, I just saw Patriot's Day. Um, How was that? I thought Patriot's Day was... Good, very good. I'd also seen Deepwater Horizon in 13 hours this year. So, and and with the two OJs, I mean, there's been a lot of. Um, Is Deepwater Horizon also Berg. Peter Berg? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that was supposed to be JC Chandor, but then yeah, he yeah. was replaced by Berg. And um, I think that Patriot's Day is better as a film than Deepwater. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how Patriot's Day is received. Uh, but it it was incredible to watch it just because that's not very long ago. And I remember just processing all of that from afar, or like over social media when it happened. But the idea that like you can take something that you'll already have like a baseline of an audience for because it's an about event that people still remember uh, mm -hmm. is very seductive. Just like the way you can just make a Captain America movie and people, there will be a baseline of people who are interested because it's Captain America. What you do after that is what makes the difference between Christopher Nolan and Zack Snyder, right? What you do after that is what makes the difference between... 13 hours has some pretty exciting sequences, but the difference between 13 hours and Ezra Edelman, you know what I mean? Right. And, and I, I, it'll be very, I'll be curious to see whether there's a wave of these kind of people trying to catch, capture the OJ wave of doing true crime or recent history it, and it, how it is happening. badly it's, they C fuck it up. CBS is doing John Binet. I mean, yeah. this is, if there's one thing TV is still good at, the one thing that hasn't changed about TV is immediate replication of something right. that's popular. Yeah. Which by the way, that's, that to me is exactly the opposite of, you know, the, the phenomenon they're trying to replicate. Because yep. a part of the appeal was is that nothing was like that. Yeah. So by the very by the thinking to oh well, let me just you know let me just glom onto that success by replicating and, it defeats the and let me not purpose. understand what was interesting about it right exactly um, but just take the broadest strokes of the log line and try to do it again. So there's pre existing IP and then there is soon to exist IP which is what Black Mirror traffics in. Ooh, you like that? That was oh. a pretty good one. Thanks. Um, I, I didn't have smart. Black Mirror on my top 10 just because... Which is crazy. And it's not on your list either? No, like San Junipero, mm -hmm. the episode would okay. be yeah, on Yeah, Playtest and San Junipero would be on, episodes. on mine. And I think Shut Up and Dance would be... Shut Up and Dance is actually my favorite. Really? With Playtest, close number two. So you're like, keep I Black Mirror dark. I love San Junipero. Yeah. What's that? You're keep Black Mirror dark. Yes, definitely. <laughs> but, you know, let me just say this about Black Mirror. I'm, I'm a little shocked here. Because again, I hear. He takes this so I listen, I look, I listen to, to you guys. I, I listen every week, and all the attributes, all the all the sort of compliments you give Atlanta in terms of it being surprising and different, and you don't know what to get week to week. Black Mirror crushes that. Yeah, crushes that, and it's actually. Let me just look here because it's pretty high up on my list. It's it's actually number two on my list, huh. uh, and 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 it and it's because it's just so brilliantly inventive. Um, it's brilliantly executed. Um, it explores psychology and human nature and our relationship with technology and um, in just this, in the freshest of ways. The voice is unparalleled. Um, did, does that mean you have to love every episode to love the show? I mean, I don't think there's, there was a, like a, a, you know, probably my least favorite episode was, what was the army one called? The one about the... Oh, uh, the a million something. What was it? I can't remember what, it, what the episode was called. And that wasn't that bad. Neither of us remember it because right. it wasn't that bad. <laughs> right. Well, it wasn't Nosedive, that bad. Nosedive was the worst one. Nosedive was the first one. You thought one. that was the Oof. worst one? Yeah. But listen, you're, make, you're, you're making a very strong point, but you're yeah. also making, our, making my rebuttal, which is you were saying that you know this is such a unique show with such a unique point of view. You don't have to like every episode to love the show or love the concept, and I completely agree. But to me, that's like a razor versus razor blades thing, which is like you can't judge this show like any other show because the nature of it is so unique, so sui generis, and so brilliant that sometimes the razor blades aren't that great, but the razor is amazing. And all the other shows, the ones that I crammed onto the list, pretty much without exception, are ones that I liked 
all the way through with a certain consistent narrative build. I Let just me, I, these are the little curly cues and tricks and cheats that we make that when I was a critic I would use to try to pack these lists. But you're, are you telling me because like, this is what this is what I ask you is that every episode of Game even Game of Thrones a show I love. Do I love every episode this season? I don't know if I'd say I'd love every episode. I don't know if I no, disliked it, any episode, it, but there were those episodes where I'm like, okay, they're connective. Yeah, I'm episodes. getting to the next episode. But the, the degree of difficulty. Can't you look at it that, that yeah, way? With the degree Black of difficulty in Black Mirror is higher than any other show. That's what I'm saying. To give it, give them that, like that. Actually, every episode they have to reintroduce characters, new setting, new uh, uh, concept. Um, and they're still kind of pulling it off. And they're still like every... Up, I mean, again, unless you just think Nosedive is terrible. which are you, Is that what you're saying? It's not a pleasant show. watch. But even within you that... You love the ending? The so ending first is fucking great. Joe Wright the ending's has to good. see but, Dunkirk is coming out, and now he's got you ethering Nosedive. Look, what I'm saying is everything... <laughs> e, e, <laughs> even if I didn't like aspects of that show, of that episode... The the vision. I am giving you negative points right now. See, I can <laughs> see it. The thumb is I'm giving you the, 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 the right tech, now. the world, the world building, your the imagination. Yelp rating all for one is hour plummeting. is astonishing. I completely agree. So, is this? Would it be in my top twelve, top fifteen? Yes. This is this is. Uh, I'm. Well, I'm about I can't to walk believe off this show. Is how seriously you take lists. I. I uh, I take lists very seriously. We're going to get to some of the other shows on our list, but let's just take a quick break. I may sponsor. not be back when you guys get back. <laughs> Hey guys, just want to tell you a little bit about proper cloth. Finding a dress shirt that fits is hard. Collars are too tight, sleeves are too long, something is always not right. Well, ordering a custom fit shirt, that's never been easier, thanks to proper cloth. At propercloth.com, you can easily create a custom shirt in seconds just by answering 10 easy questions. There's no measuring required. There are over 500 fabric styles and everything from classic business to casual shirts. Proper cloth custom shirts start at just $85. They're really high quality, made from premium Italian and Japanese fabrics. And proper cloth has literally hundreds of five-star reviews on Google and Yelp. Proper Cloth is literally the highest rated custom shirt maker on Google. Even GQ claims their favorite online shirt maker is Proper Cloth. This is the future of shirts. The website is easy to use. Your custom sizes and preferences, they're all saved into your profile. You can even order on your phone. Now, this is super important and unique. Proper Cloth guarantees a perfect fit. Remakes are absolutely free, and the team there makes it super easy to do. Stop wearing shirts that don't fit. Start looking your best. Go to propercloth.com and enter promo code WATCH to save $20 on your first shirt. That's propercloth.com slash watch and gift code WATCH for $20 off your first shirt. Hey guys, just also want to tell you about Sonos. Sonos is a smart speaker system that streams all your favorite music to any room or every room, and you control your music with one simple app. You fill your home with pure, immersive sound. I've been using Sonos for a couple of months. I love it so much. If I'm having a party, I can play Sonos, and it can be playing in every room. You can have the whole thing going. If you're studying in one room, working in another, cooking in another, you're trying to have quiet time in another, different songs, different styles of music for different rooms. One simple app brings together all your favorite music services and lets you control everything from songs to volume to rooms in any room or every room at once you can play a different song in the living room bedroom or bathroom or the same track in every room you add your existing music services or discover something new you just go to sonos.com you will not be sorry okay we're back i want to ask this is a like coming right, off the I black mirror back. thing but <laughs> Sam, he's back but he's staring he's, at he's me. back but he's not happy about it i'm very very upset we're talking with sam about his his favorite shows of the year and our favorite shows of the year I do want to ask you one last Black Mirror question that maybe we could take to go yeah. into the other shows, which is um, without getting too specific, some of the stuff that's happened in the, like the last couple of months has definitely like definitely did impact my appreciation of Black Mirror. Like yeah. I was definitely oh, like, yeah. yeah, man, like that's not a fantasy. That just that that's happening. You, you know, mean the cat cat catastrophic general election. Of, yeah, or uh, or Trump. hacking or or the way that people's lives are being uh manipulated on through social so media or through the social media has become life. weaponized and Yeah, I mean a lot of and I think that that I mean you're you're somebody who writes a show that is taking place adjacent to reality. You know what I mean? It's yeah. it's it's a, it, you have characters from our world in your show. Right. But you know, if you're working on the next season of Mr. Robot now. I mean, how much of this stuff is in your head and how much of it is in your head when you're watching television. Well, uh, uh, you know, so I'm a human. So obviously it's going to be in my head. I I, I don't love this notion that writers... Way, that's exactly what a Westworld robot would say. <laughs> I'm a human, guys. Yeah. Um, Sam, is that a bird coming out of your stomach? <laughs> um, 
No, you know what? Like, of course they're going to take in what's going yeah. on. I'm very angry that that we have this extremely uh, unprincipled, dumb person, <laughs> frankly, as as the president elect of the country. That's obviously going to fuel. That fuels creativity. That fuels art. Um, it doesn't have to be literal. It can be metaphorical. It could be whatever. But to not to try and like, um, oh, I've got to put that away. I've got to compartmentalize. Right. It's ridiculous. Why wouldn't you use that? Art's all about emotion. Um, you've got to you've got to let your strong feelings kind of filter through. And again, not necessarily literally. Um, but to get to get back as to ter- in terms of like whether it ruined your experience of watching Black Mirror. See, the, to me, the thing is, are you entertained? Yes, you could watch something depressing, and there are movies, like there are dramas, and this is part of, part of the reason why I don't love, and we're talking about dramas like with a capital D. Yeah, sure. You know what I mean? Where it's like, okay, this is a terrible part in history. You're about to tell me the story of how terrible and sad it was, and that is the end of the story, and you are going to go home and just feel sad and terrible about that part are of we, history. Are we talking about the Americans now <laughs> or later? <laughs> <laughs> but to me, it's like, and I, I know you and I have talked about this, Chris. I want to be fucking entertained. Yeah. And I'm not saying there's there's no legitimate purpose for those kind of stories, because maybe that's a learning thing or not. I don't want to just learn. I want to learn and be entertained. And that's the thing about Black Mirror. I think, yes, does it reflect our society, maybe the worst parts of our society? It does. But in the most, in my opinion, the inter, in the most entertaining way. Interesting. Okay. Here's the show I want to make the case for um, is Quarry, which is a show that was on Cinemax. It is a uh, crime show, 19, early 1970s. Um, a guy comes back from the Vietnam War and basically becomes an, a hired assassin um, in, in the South. And, you know, first of all, Sam, I don't know if you, if you know about this, but this show, every episode was directed by one guy, which I just think, I don't know if that's ever been done I heard, before. Uh, I don't know. On, on television. <laughs> but... Uh, but a lot of props to Greg Atanas because this and, show and and I've because I've heard that actually Sepinwall yeah. wrote about one of the episodes as being this remark. I don't know which the, episode the last was. episode, yeah, which yeah. is that we finally reveals what the main character did in Vietnam, and it's right. basically they he do, he does a wonder like everyone wants to do the big tracking right. shot, and it is absolutely devastating and astonishing, and right up there with anything else that's been any any other shot or sequence that we've been lionizing on TV from Battle of the Bastards to the episode of True Detective. Yeah. Um, this show, I love crime to shows. Mr. Robot I love, season two. <laughs> not, I'm not, I'm not familiar with it. Um, it hey, you're on you're my list. You're going to have to make season three like one shot. Yeah, just, just one. Like, What's up now, fuckers? <laughs> ten hour the shot. The entire season. You have to sit there for ten hours. Just, you'll have to explain that to Rami. We'll go along with it. Um, no, I just. No, I, we're not breaking for lunch. What we're talking about for atmosphere, like Quarry was just absolutely astonishing. Can I, I just want to say. Design. I want to just yeah. put it out there. I haven't seen this show. No, I know. Yet. I'm trying to get you. I'm looking I'm, at you. I, I do want to watch it. It, it in terms you of atmosphere, me. in terms of place, uh, era, vibe, like the smoldering cigarettes, the music, the sweat. You feel that you are in this place. I think it's period, one of the right? most. It's period. Yeah, it's like 1972. Okay, Memphis. It's the performances. Logan Marshall Green is is really terrific in it. Anyway, I just I, I need to make the case for Quarry on Cinemax. If you have a subscription, you can watch it all on Max Go. I just thought the show was absolutely. It, it blew me away. I was surprised by it. I was already a sucker for this kind of thing. Um, Chris probably is too because it's just a hard boiled like it's really pulp, cool pulp show. It's my number three because it succeeded it far beyond. It's, it is on my list. Yeah, uh, yeah. What's one of yours? So I have two. Well, I'm not going to bore you with Horace and Pete. I know you assholes haven't watched it yet. <laughs> um, I don't know why. It's, that's actually my number one. If we're going just strictly stricted, it's huh. it's my number one. It's, I it's, Fantasy. it's um, and if you it. you know by the way. The weird thing is, I've se- I've seen it on a few lists. I've seen it on a few top ten lists. I don't know why it's not getting a, a little more attention, but um, so that's I mean, your number one show, though. Number one show. I mean, talk about inventiveness uh, t- it, from the distribution model. Um, it's literally just destroying any concept of whatever the hell we used to call TV, um, and it's just going in, in whatever direction it wants to go in the most gleeful way possible. And it's funny and it's sad and it's about mental illness and it's uh, uh, about relationships and it's about fathers and sons. And uh, it, it's just up and it's got brilliant performances literally from top down. I mean, um, Lori Metcalf, you know, you've heard about her monologue and it's I mean, I think she got nominated literally for that one scene. Um, but she's uh, it, it, but that's that's doing a disservice to everybody else who's also amazing in the show. So it literally like not only is it, it it's like basically in it 
it's experimentation, it's style, it's substance in in peak form. Okay, I, I can't I can't rate it higher enough. And one other show, you, just want to throw out. The, yeah, you, go ahead. You've you've admitted that you have watched shows because we have advocated for them. We yeah, owe I you, mean, like, we, we will do you the service. I will you. go back and I will yeah. watch that. Thank you. A more fun one I'll throw out there because it was it was a uh, uh, number eight on my list. I think it was uh, there's actually this show called Three Percent. Have you heard about this Ooh, on oh. Netflix? On Netflix, Brazilian show, and I thought it was really fun. It's like this weird. It like does YA what I want YA dystopia to do. But they just, you know, because it's in the movies and it's PG-13 and try and get kids to watch it, they don't, in my opinion, n- don't necessarily do it well. It does it with some teeth. Huh. It's, it's actually kind of a fun watch. I think oh, you should- 3%. 3%. That's a good get. What do you got? I know, he went deep. Um, I, I was going to shout this out- this shit seriously, Greenwald. <laughs> so I wanted to Someone should. shout out, um, we haven't talked about this 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 series in a really long time. I, I think it we came and we were excited and then we were kind of like just, I mean, maybe maybe we just just lost momentum with it, but um, I really liked Preacher a lot. Can, can I say something in my defense? When I was making this list, I was doing it for the uh, Seppenwall's uh, Up Rocks Critics Poll, and he had best series, best new series. I forgot Preacher existed. Yeah, I really dug it too. That, but was there, it on Seppenwall's list? I don't even know if it was on it, but I was making my list for his thing, oh. so this will be published. Oh, got and it. Even at a best new oh, series list. It would have been on my best new series list and I forgot it. So I don't really, I don't think I've ever self-identified as like a nerd or like a fanboy kind of thing. Well, you but, didn't need to self-identify. Well, no, but I mean, I, so the, the we're, issue with it though is that, you know, it, it that, that kind of, the rise of like nerd culture and the sort of dominance it has over, I, I sort of resent it in terms of the, in the movies, especially where I'm just like, it sucks that all the oxygen is taken up by these 15 tentpole superhero franchise movies per year. Sam loves Marvel movies. Love he put it. it, he wrote it I, into Mr. Robot. But I, I don't like them at the expense of everything from say nocturnal animals having a big, bigger budget or like nobody trying to make trading places or 48 hours anymore. You know what I mean? And I don't know that those aren't one to one exchanges that are happening, but in my mind it's just like we are I'm like I'm 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 seeing Rogue One tonight. I'm like of electricity running through me. It's not like I'm not down for this stuff. But my the reason why I'm talking about Preacher is because Preacher actually re- awoke up the nerd in me where I was like, I actually don't even have a ton of uh, allegiance to the comic in the first place. But the um, passion and energy of the filmmaking in the in the show and also the performances were so refreshing mm. that I was just blown away by it. And it kind of made me like, believe in that as source material again the to cast some too i mean yeah the so, cast is just incredible one of the things about this peak tv era that people don't talk about is just the lack of resources there, right. there aren't enough great actors to make all these projects great and they got three great actors in that show right yeah they had i mean um joseph gilgan and ruth nega and dominic cooper the yeah. three main leads are just so i should, should here's the thing i don't i'm like kind of done with comic book i i mean i am gonna watch legion like that looks interesting. Um, and I, I hear it's Holly. Good. Yeah. And, and I, and I, and yeah. You know, the I've writing some, is patchy. I've, I've yeah. heard, uh, yeah. <laughs> right. In spite of the writing, I've heard it could, it could be, it could be an interesting show. Um, what if but, we, I can't wait to give when that show comes on and all I talk about is the cinematography. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I feel qualified to talk about. It's good framing. <laughs> um, but look, let me just say this. So for whatever reason, the comic book, genre is just not in my so it's but, but given that did i love richard donner's superman absolutely okay. did i love tim burton's batman it's still probably my favorite superhero movie did, of you, all lo- time. did you love gavin hood's x-men origins wolverine i did not <laughs> no. can, can i just put a pin in one thing here for the next podcast we're gonna do yeah because we are all the same age we need to do a podcast on the formative movies of the 80s that yeah. That actually matter like we need to talk about but it like, shouldn't really be a discussion it just should be us listing 112 we, movies from the 80s and seeing if Sam but just like them. like like hot dog the movie like all this stuff that used to oh, be yeah, on like cable that. like this is these are formative like you're accidentally at home and you watch this movie it's not z- it's it's not that it's like uh has as much zombie stuff although it has quite a bit of supernatural stuff this is hot dog the movie this or preacher, preacher. <laughs> preacher. Oh, right. it's that they have the like same kind of like TV let's tie a camera to a two by four and like swing the two by four around kind of like energy that sam yeah. raimi and like early coen brothers had that too and raising arizona and yeah. Blood simple and i don't know it's just uh i'm excited to see what i love do. peter jackson like old like have you ever seen bad taste yeah that's exactly I mean, okay yeah or dead yeah. live okay great. that's the vibe all right i'll check it out so what about you? Um, I'll just run through a couple more so we don't... We, uh, 
obviously there there was. Are a show we wrapping in, up? Is this it? Do well, I, I, have to... I have I have, a, I have a final question for you, but yeah, we're wrapping up soon. But I, I mean, should I list the? Go ahead. Yeah, you yeah go. bang it out. I, I go did go have a show it. in USA called Mr. Robot, but that's only because so I know you don't like compliments, so it's only because the Elf performance. Okay. Great. That, that's <laughs> why I liked it. Um, as long as it's just for Elf. Uh, Fleabag, I just thought was astonishing. Which, by um, the way, I've seen the first few of those. Yeah. I love it. I, I haven't finished you it You just got to get back to it. I got to get back to it. Um, Catastrophe, I think, is funnier than almost anything else on TV. Um, Halt and Catch Fire did something this season, especially in the last two episodes, that was really surprising and really exciting with this time jump that set them up for an even better show. I mean, it's, it's a unique circumstance where it's a show that has kind of been chasing the best version of itself and somehow had four seasons of fully funded television to do that. But I think they finally found it. Um, well, that's my whole list. So your turn. Uh, Wait, you, you missed one. No, I, well, I, I mentioned, um, Did you uh, mention Stranger you? Things and OJ before. And Americans. I heard I said Americans when you were looking. What what is the what? But what's the ranking? Like what do you? Oh, um, Atlanta number one, Americans two, Corey three. Got it. That's my top three. I'll run through the last few because I want to spend more time on yours. I have Last Panthers and Gamora on my list because you love Europeans shooting. Europe each other. seems really chill. Uh, <laughs> Gamora is. Um, if you haven't seen Gamora, like that's like a real good litmus t- test to how how 100 you can keep it because there is no brightness in Gamora. It's just literally dudes just shooting each other in Italian projects. And then crying. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> not really like just running each other over with motorcycles and well, no, they don't game. cry when they they get they cry when they get shot and then right, they die like right. that kind of crying um other shows i, I, have I on, would cry too, on mine to uh we talked about search party i just found that to oh, be yeah. like a really delightful um awesome example of hey we're gonna make this thing we're gonna put it out hopefully people like it i loved it i'm glad people caught on to it um uh, I was really glad to see Aaliyah Shawkat get, you know, a, a show, a full show. And she actually had a really cool year. If you guys, if you haven't seen her in Green Room. Green like Room is of the year. badass. Yeah. That director, by the way, remember our director test? Yeah. That dir- He might be his, it. Jeremy you, Saulnier. Saulnier, yeah. yeah. Uh, and my, wow. other, my other ones director. are uh, Can't do hard, Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown, which is sort of our, me and Andy's but one of our favorites. Cheat. It is a cheat. We've talked about the Houston episode being one of our favorite episodes of television this year. Uh, then you got to throw on Samantha B. No Samantha B. No full. I don't frontal. have any politics stuff on mine. I'm 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 out. Newsroom on, season two. I'm out on all. Going that. back to rewatching that. <laughs> uh, Stranger Things. Corey and Preacher. Yeah. So. All right. Bring it home. Okay. I got. Well, I did Horace and Peter already. Black Mirror. Game of Thrones. In Atlanta. Girlfriend experience, which you guys haven't. It seen. was late fifteen. It would have been on my list. I'm not. I'm oh, not even trying to. Are you saying it's ineligible? It is not late fifteen. It, it was late fifteen. No, it was not. Oh, that's the Nick season two. Yes, GFE is 16. is like Pure spring 16. spring sixteen. I got the one. I got to finish. Amazing. I got to get back to it. It was amazing. Yeah, takes take something off. <laughs> or Rewrite that. Um, I'll take one of my European tra- shows off. Transparent, <laughs> but you guys. Did you I like transparent a lot this year, but not on your list. Interesting. Um, I just this is this is a really good example of like a lot of stuff that's like just around the same level for me, and it was mm-hmm. just picking the stuff that I, I I loved. Transparent, like for me, just kind of gets better every year. It's and for comedy especially to do that. Like actually, the other Com- show, comedy, yeah, quotes. exactly, yeah. But the other the other show is actually comedy with a capital C is Veep. Yeah, which is the other one. I, Veep is so crazy funny and so dangerously close to the truth in an abstract way up to this year, just in terms of like, I think of how Washington really works. It's something that our pals from Keep It at 1600 have said multiple times that Veep is much more accurate to their experience in it's Washington. Like second than, only to designated survivor. Second only to designated survivor and certainly not at all like but House of Cards. But what are they going to do now? Like, wh- where is the comedy? Uh, you know, I don't know. And I, again, maybe it's just me because I can compartmentalize a little better, but I have to say... Is there is there a show? And I love you know, there's a lot of comedies that I didn't make my list. I obviously don't LOL the transparent, right? Um, I don't even know if I really LOL Atlanta. I don't know if I no. L- I, L- I, if we're talking about you know I OL to part parts of Atlanta. Yeah, with parts. the invisible car. And but I L Veep, the invisible car, yeah. <laughs> but Veep on point it's just every so funny. Sunday the Veep episode night. where Hugh Laurie and Julie Louis Dreyfus like just tear each other's heads off at the end of that episode it was like it was how about just i think my favorite maybe my favorite moment on tv is when they have the secret meeting without gary and then they also have the secret meeting without like just that moment i mean i just we should have done we're gonna have next week people will hear our our nominees for the wall our sort of people of the year and basically we need to do a podcast just to say that kevin dunn is the greatest performer of any year um for that performance on veep um before we end here you're 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 in the midst of mr robot right now preparing season three 
what do you like most about this part of the process when you're actually writing it, you're with your writers, you're not, because directing takes up a lot of your time too, but what do you like about this? Process? I mean, this is the fun part because you just make up shit. You're literally kind of coming, I mean, the frustrating part is when you're wa- reading back and you're breaking story and you're like, well, wait a minute, this is boring, we've seen it. And, and then you are kind of racking your brain to keep it fresh, keep it alive. And then that's when it gets really exciting. And so for me, this is the fun part. I always look at making a, a film or whatever TV, a, a, the, the three parts it kind of goes like this. The writing is kind of like, you know, imagine, you know, you just let your imagination run free. You know, it's like your fantasy. It's all perfect in your head. Production is when everything just like goes to shit and like all the mistakes happen and the production, you know, it's like everything's just falling apart and people are late and whatever. And you just got, and then out of that comes, you know, oh, they actually, actually that's better. The changes are better. People come with the great ideas and the, and the production design is what isn't exactly what you uh, thought of in your head and a new creation starts to form. And then editing is like kind of bringing it all home. So Honestly, it's it. They're all like you kind of get you kind of get annoyed with every process towards the end of each process because you you know and then you get re inspired uh, like as you begin the next stage. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit about what we might be excited for for next year. Yeah. Right. Personally, um, I've just you know because of the Nick and because of girlfriend experience, which he executive produced, I'm just really excited when Steven Soderbergh makes television. He's got this show coming out on Netflix called Godless. Just set in a New Mexico mining town with Michelle Dockery from. Wow, uh, I have not heard about this. Yeah, and it and is. Now I'm excited. I'm just really. really he, pumped. he made this. He yeah, him this? and Scott Frank. He's directing it. Scott Frank. Wow, Frank's wow. Yeah. that's crazy. So I'm really excited for that. Now I, I'm excited. I, I got for two. That. Young Pope. <laughs> I am excited I'm for that. So excited for the Young that Pope that trailer. Just I mean, what the fuck is that? Also, by the way, it's like what you were saying. It, this is a one filmmaker. Going for it. Yeah. Who has not made television before, directed every episode, got Jude Law to play a chain smoking young and Pope Diane named Lenny. to play a nun. Yeah. I'm so psyched. And it's going to be on HBO every Sunday, and we're going to be talking about it. Um, the other one is, guys, Twin Peaks is coming back. Oh, yeah. This that's is, crazy. Uh, <laughs> this is so crazy. Yeah. The, Do we know if it's all 16 episodes? Like, is he? Is it running 16 straight weeks? Do we know that? Or is that, I don't know if anyone that? knows. Like, it was supposed it's, to be seven, and then he didn't stop, and he cast everyone in the world, and he was just been doing this so i don't even know if showtime knows what they have but this is the most that was the most important show in many ways of my life was my first obsession my first favorite show i cannot believe there's going to be more of them and uh that's happening this year i'm probably i am excited i'm genuinely excited for uh legion um fargo fargo season three yeah season three which because to me it's like you know the one thing is i i every year right you like it's especially in movies, I did this all the time where you, you, you think, okay, I want, I just want one masterpiece. Like there's going to be all these guys trying and then we're talking the top of the top and, you, and you're lucky you get the one masterpiece. And sometimes in, in a year you get two. Like I think I, the last time I remember, like the, there will be blood and, and uh, no country for old men. And Michael out. Clayton. And there was a couple of those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then it's just like, wow. Um, and last year, with TV, it, 2015, I thought Fargo season two, that was our that was our masterpiece, and, and Horse and Pea is number one on my list. Do I know if it? Do I think it's a? I I love it. I don't know if I consider it a masterpiece. Right. Do you guys feel like there was a masterpiece in TV this no, season? No, I don't. Not in the way that you're talking about. No, yeah. I think because so I much of our love like, Atlanta. Wait, excitement. do you agree with me on Fargo season two or no? It's a masterpiece. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm corrupt. Do you? Now, I do. Chris? Yeah. And I also think that. Because I think that was a pretty flawless season of television. There was a sustained level of excellence or competence or pleasure in television this year that was higher maybe than any other year I've been watching TV. But the highs, like very, very highest ceiling was not as high as it has been when Mad Men was just locked in or Lost was locked in or Deadwood was locked in. Yeah. Or, so I think that they're like, we, we were sitting here, we could do another hour of all the other shows that we also liked or, you know. Yeah, I but, liked a lot. Yeah, but the, the, I, I felt the same way this year about movies where I was like, there's a lot of very good movies. I was going to ask you about that yeah. because I, I haven't watched as many. I still haven't seen Moonlight or Hell or High Water or La La Land or yeah. any of those. And I really, and I love Arrival, love yeah. Arrival. I don't know if I had, if I got my masterpiece. Yeah, I don't think so. So that just means, hey, for people in the creative community listening, you just got to try harder. I mean, <laughs> just get, just grind. Guys, yeah. what is, oh, wait a minute. I'm part, 
Whoops. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much to Sam for joining us. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, guys. What a great year in television. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, Baranskis. Hey guys, really quick, just want to say thank you to Sonos again. Sonos is a smart speaker system that streams all your favorite music to any room or every room, and you control your music with one simple app and fill your home with pure, immersive sound. Andy and I love Sonos. We've been using it for months. It has changed the way we both listen to music in our homes. Bring all your music in one app. One simple app brings together all your favorite services and lets you control everything from songs to volume to rooms. You can listen to podcasts. You can listen to the radio from all over the country on TuneIn. You can listen to Spotify, Apple, whatever, in any room or every every room at once you can play a different song in the living room bedroom or bathroom or the same track in every room if you're having a party add your existing music services or discover something new go to sonos.com hey guys thanks to proper cloth you know finding a dress shirt that fits is hard collars are too tight sleeves are too long something is always not right well ordering a custom fit shirt that's never been easier thanks to proper cloth at propercloth.com you can easily create a custom shirt size in seconds by answering 10 easy questions no measuring is required Proper Cloth even guarantees a perfect fit. Remakes are absolutely free, and the team there is there to make it super easy to do. Look, just stop wearing shirts that don't fit. Go to propercloth.com and enter gift code WATCH to save $20 off your first shirt. That's propercloth.com slash watch and enter gift code WATCH for $20 off your first shirt.